Welcome to the Jewelry Resellers Podcast, your go-to source for all things shiny, sparkly, and of course, profitable. I'm your host, Desiree, and I'll be your guide on this dazzling journey through the world of reselling jewelry. We'll be diving deep into the art and science of reselling, uncovering valuable tips, insider secrets, and sharing stories from successful jewelry resellers. We'll explore market trends, industry news, and even discuss how to find those hidden gems just waiting to be discovered in thrift stores, estate sales, and beyond. So if you're dreaming of turning your hobby into a hustle, or if you're a seasoned pro looking to stay at the top of your jewelry reselling game, join me each week for insights, stories, and more on the Jewelry Resellers Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Jewelry Resellers Podcast. My name is Desiree, and in this episode, we are going to talk about how to identify vintage jewelry when you are outsourcing or maybe when you are just trying to do some research and trying to learn what you have. Maybe you already have some pieces in your jewelry collection and you don't know how to identify them. So today, I'm going to share some things that I think could help you and Even though this is an audio format and I'm not able to show you images or pictures or anything like that, these are just some things to remember and keep in mind as you learn about the different types of jewelry, different styles and designs and all of those things. So I'm going to go over a lot of that today. But of course, before we get started, I want to remind you to join our weekly newsletter because that is also going to That's going to help you learn jewelry, of course. Well, I should say what is going to help you learn jewelry is what I'm going to send you when you join our Jewelry Resellers podcast family. So I want to to send you a list of the 20 best-selling vintage jewelry brands that if you are a jewelry reseller, you really want to know these. At least this list will help you get started because that is one of the questions I get asked the most is what are the brands I should be looking for? Which brands sell the most? Which brands sell best online? And this list answers those questions and more. Okay, so if you'd like to get a free copy of that list, all you got to do is head on over to the website and that is jewelryresellerspodcast.com. All right, I also have a link in the description and the show notes for you. All right, so let's get back to identifying vintage jewelry and learning exactly how to go about doing that. Because I know when I was getting started, that was probably one of the most overwhelming things was knowing, okay, I have a necklace or earrings or whatever the case may be, but I don't know where to start as it relates to researching this. And how do you tell if it's something that is I don't want to say necessarily worth a lot of money, but something that could have high value, right? Because not everybody buys jewelry or collects jewelry just because it's high value. Some people collect jewelry because they like a certain design. Some people collect jewelry just because it's a certain color or maybe a certain theme, you know, like uh, birds and stuff like that. All right, but today we are going to talk about the key aspects of looking at a piece and how to really examine a piece so you can figure out how to determine its age, maybe its origin, and in some cases, the authenticity as well. All right, so you don't have to be a jewelry expert. I don't think really any of us are, but sometimes just having a little bit of extra knowledge is all you need to be further ahead of other people out there who could be doing the same things, looking for the same types of jewelry pieces and so on. All right, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about some of these strategies. All right, so number one, we want to look for hallmarks and maker's marks. Sometimes people call these stamps. So usually a good piece of jewelry will have some type of a stamp or marking all it. On it. Now that's not always the case, but that is the first thing we want to look for. We want to look for if there is some type of 
engraved stamp or a name or a symbol or a logo or something like that. All right, so look for stamps. Many vintage pieces are stamped with hallmarks indicating the metal purity. And we all know that usually 14K, you know, for 14 karat gold or maker's marks, which can identify the designer or the manufacturer. All right, now it's really nice because now we have what is called Google Lens. And if you're able to get an a photo or snap a picture of the maker's mark, like if you didn't know what it was, you could run that through Google Lens and see if you get any results that way. Okay, that is what I do a lot. And I know a lot of my fellow jewelry reseller friends also do that a lot. So that's a good tool for you to know about and to use. Okay, and that is going to help you with your research as well. So you want to research these marks. Like I said, Google Lens is a really good place to start. You can also use jewelry reference books or online databases to research hallmarks and maker's marks, as these can often tell you the origin and sometimes the age of a piece. Okay. Now, if you are not on Facebook, I want to say you might want to consider getting on Facebook just for the access to some of these jewelry groups because there are several groups that I know of where they actually have libraries, catalogs, archives of maker's marks and hallmarks for jewelry. So you can search through them and you can see if maybe your particular piece is listed in these files. All right, now the one I know of is Texas Gal. I think it's Texas Gal's Jewelry Lovers Group. And then the other one is my friend Lily Works Reseller. She has a really nice catalog of um, maker's marks and she has photos and then the name of the designer or the brand as well. So that will help you look up a particular piece if you have no idea. Or sometimes you can even take a picture of the piece. You can post it in one of these groups. And one of those helpful ladies will be probably able to identify something for you, or at least give you some ideas of where to start. Okay. So those groups are really helpful. I really enjoy them. And I learn so much just by interacting there. All right, let's go on to number two, and that is style and design. Now this is going to take a little bit of study. You know, it's not going to be like, you know, college level courses, but of course uh, you could do that too, but you want to study the different jewelry eras familiarize yourself with styles from different periods. In other words, Art Deco, Victorian, Edwardian. You know, certain design elements are characteristic of specific eras. Now, this is something I have really decided to go deep into myself. I'm really studying these because I want to be able to, at a glance, know what era a particular piece of jewelry is from. Now, it's it's a lot to learn, so I would definitely focus on one particular area or era at a time. You know, for example, if you want to learn Art Deco, just study Art Deco maybe for a week or, or a day, however long. And YouTube, of course, is a great place. I've talked about that a lot in previous episodes. But knowing the jewelry eras is going to help you a lot when you are out sourcing jewelry. Okay. I also want to talk about motifs. So you want to look for popular motifs of certain periods. And when we think about motifs, like for example, nature inspired designs were really popular during the Art Nouveau era. And then like geometric shapes were really heavy in the Art Deco era. So when I think about motifs, I think about the artwork and the shapes and the inspiration as to how that jewelry was crafted or how that jewelry was designed. Okay, so that's something to think about as well. All right, number three is the construction and the craftsmanship. Now, this is something I've gotten pretty good at as it relates to brooches. Now, I'm not 
going to say I'm an expert by any means, but I can look at certain brooches and I can identify how or when it was made. And you can also sometimes learn about the uh, materials that made the particular piece. So you want to examine the construction very closely. Older jewelry pieces often show signs of craftsmanship that is very different from modern mass mass produced items. You know, for example, older pieces might have handcrafted clasps or settings. And sometimes there's, I don't want to call them flaws, but little irregularities when the piece was designed because it may have been designed by hand or, you know, maybe using certain tools that, that now they have machines for, but maybe back then they didn't have the machinery. So a lot of the, the pieces were made and crafted by hand. All right. We also want to pay attention to the materials that are used. The materials can also give clues to a piece's age. One of my favorite materials is Bakelite, and that was popular in the early 20th century. Bakelite definitely has a distinct look, although sometimes it can be hard to tell. But those of you who are familiar with Bakelite, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So sometimes if you know what the piece is made of or made with, you can I use that to identify more information as it relates to that piece of jewelry. All right, number four is the wear and the patina. So signs of wear, vintage jewelry may show signs of wear consistent with its age. Look for patina on metal, which can also indicate an older piece. So sometimes you can see clearly wear or wear patterns on a piece of jewelry. And that will give you a good clue as to not only the age of the piece, but maybe how the piece was worn or how the piece was used, depending on what it is. So, and when we talk about patina, because I know some people confuse dirt <laughs> or they think patina means it's dirty. Uh, not, not really, not really. Patina is just the natural aging process on certain metals. And so the colors could change. Sometimes the texture can change. And so you want to be aware of that when you're looking at pieces up close. And some people really like that heavy patina on these older pieces because it gives, it gives the pieces character. It shows that the piece is in, in its original condition or as close to its original condition as it can be. And a lot of people cherish that and they value that. So don't assume that if something is heavily patina that nobody will want it. As a matter of fact, like I said, some people really prefer the heavy patina look. All right, let's talk about the condition of stones. This is also falling under the wear and patina. The condition of stones and the cut of certain gemstones will also indicate certain things. Old mine cuts of European or European cuts on diamonds, for example, suggest that the piece is likely to be antique. So I am not that well versed on gemstones. I know a little bit, but I don't know enough <laughs> to save my life. But because there's certain cuts, maybe that were popular then that may not be popular now, that could give us a lot of information, right? That could give us a lot, a lot of information as to when the piece was made, maybe what the purpose was or what was popular back then. And again, like I said earlier, it could maybe indicate that the piece was an antique, which is very exciting. Okay, so let's move on to number five, which is the weight and feel. Now, not you're not always going to be able to hold a piece of jewelry. Sometimes, especially if you're buying it online, you're going to have to just look at photos. And sometimes, even if you're at an estate sale or something like that, you may not be able to actually hold or touch the pieces 
like they could be locked up in a glass case or something like that. So you may not be able to actually hold them. But if you can, that's another way to figure out what, what the piece is, what it's made of, and all the things that we've been talking about. Now, I like to use the word hefty, or I like to use the word weighty. And that means, you know, the piece feels pretty solid. It doesn't feel cheap, flimsy, or lightweight, or like it's hollow. I know sometimes you can feel like the, um, the texture of certain types of metals, and you can tell it feels like a, a higher quality metal. All right, so older pieces, especially those made from precious metals, tend to feel heavier than many of the contemporary pieces. And that is due to the materials and the constructions, the construction methods that were used when it was made. So this isn't, like I said, this isn't always something you can do, but it is another way to figure out at least the quality of a piece. All right, number six is all about the types of clasps and findings. So let's talk about first clasp styles. The style of clasps on necklaces and bracelets can indicate age. For example, barrel clasps were commonly used in the early 20th century, while the lobster claw clasps are a more modern invention. Now, if you have ever watched any of my Poshmark jewelry shows, I talk about this all the time, that I am such a stickler for clasp, and I love vintage clasp, and I love a good a good, solid, well-made class, because to me, that indicates the true quality of the piece. And you know, lobster clasps aren't necessarily bad, but you can, you just know that those are probably not something that you're going to find on a lot of vintage or antique pieces of jewelry. And for me, I prefer the older style clasp just because, in my opinion, they're so much easier to put on and off. You know, it's much easier to unscrew the barrel or, you know, hook on, you know, hook one end to the chain or, you know, whatever, or slide. I think it's called a uh, box clasp where you slide, you know, you slide one one end <laughs> into the box Um, so I really like those types of clasp and I have a clasp thing. And so whenever I'm selling jewelry, if a piece has an amazing clasp, I'm going to probably gush about it just because I appreciate them so much. Okay. So the clasp styles are one way to kind of date a piece or figure out, you know, how well it's made. Now, the other thing we want to look at, if you're looking at earrings, are the earring backs. So the type of earring backs can also help to figure out a time period of a piece or a a pair of earrings, I should say. Screwback non-pierced earrings were popular before the 1950s. And then after that is when pierced ear jewelry became much more common. So I have sold quite a few screwback earrings and there are people who absolutely love them. Now I have to say screwback earrings are much more, in my experience, have been much more popular than the clip-on earrings. And I think because with the screwbacks, you can actually adjust, you know, how tight it's holding on to your earlobe. With the clip-on, you know, it just clips on and that's it. You can't adjust the pressure at all. So that has just been my own experience, and I know people really enjoy the screwback, not only because it's vintage, but just because it's more comfortable. Or I shouldn't say vintage, maybe even, oh no, we're not quite at antique yet because that's 1950s. Okay, now another tip I want to encourage you to learn to use, which is actually these are some tools, and that's a magnifying glass or a jeweler's loop. And that's L-O-U-P-E, a jeweler's loop, which is basically one of those um, magnifying glass, I guess, (laughs) is the best way is the best way to describe it. But some of them have little lights on them and it helps you see really small details and markings that may not be visible 
to the naked eye. All right, and they're not very big and they're not very expensive. As a matter of fact, you can find them on Amazon. Uh, if you'd like to see the one that I recommend, you can head on over to the website and check out the resources page. I have all of these tools listed for you and I do have links in case you would like to see or, or maybe you know shop around. But if you are going to be out and you know you're going to be sourcing jewelry or maybe you're headed to an estate sale or a flea market or a yard sale, uh, you can keep one of these in your purse or in your pocket, whatever. So that way, if you do come across some jewelry, you can really look and see if there's any markings on there that will help you determine uh, the age of the piece or the brand of the piece and so forth. Okay, so you want to keep that. I keep one, I keep two actually. I keep a magnifying glass in my purse and I also keep a loop in my purse at all times because I never know. <laughs> you never know when you are going to come across something. Sometimes I make these impromptu thrift store runs or I'm driving and I come across a yard sale. So you always want to be prepared. All right, so tip number eight is to consult with experts. And you know, this is not gonna be something you're gonna do every day or every time you find an interesting jewelry piece, but this is where what I talked about earlier, joining those Facebook groups, where this could be helpful. Because even though not everybody in those groups is an expert, a lot of those women and men in those groups are extremely knowledgeable and they will help you figure out what you have or they will tell you, you know, oh, I recognize that. That is, you know, whatever, <laughs> I don't know, a brand. And they will say, so you can start checking here. Or sometimes people know exactly what you have and they have a similar piece and they'll say, oh yes, this is that, that and the other. But you know, that's probably one way, but there actually are people out there who are vintage jewelry experts or vintage jewelry appraisers. So if you are unsure about a piece, consulting with someone like that could provide valuable insights and more information for you. Now, of course, this is not going to be a free service. The Facebook groups are free, but if you are working with someone who's an expert or an appraiser, I doubt that they would do that for free. They probably, you know, charge a, a nominal fee, whatever, and they'll look at the piece and they will help you uh, appraise it, maybe authenticate it and so forth. Okay, so, and I don't even know because I've never actually reached out or worked with any type, you know, anybody like that. But I would assume you probably could go online and do a search for vintage jewelry expert or vintage jewelry appraiser and see what comes up. Sometimes at um, estate sales, they, they work with uh, jewelry appraisers too. Uh, but I don't know if they would actually share that person's information with you, but because um, a lot of estate sales, they get jewelry and they also, you know, they may not know what they have either. And so they'll work with a professional. So that way they can make sure they're selling it at, at a price that is reasonable or I should say fair. Okay, uh, let me scroll down here on my notes. My last tip is research and reference. Now this part is fun to me because researching, I really enjoy when it comes to jewelry. I just love it. It's, it's one of those things that I will never get tired of doing. I love to look at it. I love to learn about it. I love to see it either in pictures or in person, whatever in videos, even on YouTube. But if you have a passion for this, I think you can understand where I'm coming from, that if you just love jewelry, uh, this doesn't feel like work. And you will probably start building your own collection of books and reference materials to help you learn about all the different types of jewelry that is out there. And there's probably more than we could even, you know, talk about or list. But you want to use reference books and online resources to your advantage. There are so many books, so many books and websites dedicated to vintage jewelry. And these can be invaluable for comparing pieces and learning about specific designers and styles. All right, so don't, um, you know, don't discount 
some of these resources, you know, maybe just because, oh, it's free or, or it's just a random website on the internet. No, it's, there's a lot of information. That is how I learn. That is how I continue to learn. And that is something, like I said, that I really enjoy doing. Like if I didn't have, (laughs) if I didn't have adult responsibilities, I probably would spend my days just researching and looking at jewelry. Like truly, I love watching the videos. Uh, I have several books in my personal library, um, but I know even my local library, they have a really nice uh, selection of books, jewelry books, Uh, you know, all kinds, all kinds of jewelry. So the more you learn, like I said, the the more knowledgeable you can be, it's going to be much easier for you not only to identify what you have, but also to really be that much further ahead when you are outsourcing and people are out there, you know, trying to buy jewelry too, because we all know it's starting to get really competitive now. But not everybody knows everything. So this is a way you can give yourself a very clear advantage and how you can make this information work for you. Okay, Uh, that is it. So let me run through this list again. I will just uh, do bullet points. So if you're trying to identify vintage jewelry, these are the things you want to pay attention to. Number one, hallmarks and maker's marks. Number two, style and design. Number three, construction and craftsmanship. Number four, wear and patina. Number five, weight and feel. Six, types of clasps and findings. Seven, use your magnifying glass or your jeweler's loop. Eight, consult with experts if you can. And finally, nine, research and reference. So identifying vintage jewelry is both an art and a science requiring a keen eye, patience, and like I said, a little bit of research. Over time, you'll develop these skills to more easily recognize and appreciate the unique quality of vintage jewelry pieces. All right, my friends, and with that, I am going to wrap up this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. If you have any, you know, any other ideas on how to identify vintage jewelry that I did not talk about in today's episode, please let me know. I would love to hear it because we're all here trying to learn together and we're all trying to do this to the best of our ability so we can make the money that we desire to make. And I understand not everybody is doing this as a business. Some of us just do this for the love of it, you know, and we just we just love the beauty and all the uniqueness of the vintage jewelry pieces. So with that, thank you so much. And I will check in with you again really soon.